I'm really very happy to have uh, Florian today. So I want to briefly introduce um, Professor Florian Ije. So currently he is an associate professor at the University of Paris Dauphin since uh, 2015, teaching data science and machine learning in the department uh, middle. Within the LAM study, he is part of the team, Miles, which uh, focuses on trustworthy, oh, sorry, so it's gone. <laughs> trustworthy machine learning and explainable AI. From uh, 2014 to uh, 2015, he was a JSPS postdoc doctoral fellow in the laboratory of Professor Sugiyama at the Tokyo University. He received his PhD in computer science from Littitz University Day Wong uh, under the supervision of Alain Latokoma Moji in 2013. He contributes <laughs> to, to the problem of representation learning with a particular interest in the representation of structured data, graphs, covariance matrices, and the development of learning algorithms for non-Euclidean spaces. He is a visiting researcher at Riken AIP Japan since uh, 2017 and is a member of the uh, Prairie Paris Artificial Intelligence Research Institute, where he holds a junior chair. Okay, so today he will talk about a uh, geometric adventure in machine learning, learning with invariant structure and prior knowledge. So let's welcome Florian. Thank you, thank you, Makoto, for the introduction. So um, today, so um, the talk will be about machine learning, but with a, a geometric lens, so with a particular view on that, and um, showing that uh, taking into account this knowledge this view can be can be beneficial um so well i'm not going to do my cv again but just to say that uh, prior to that i was a paris uh, paris dauphine now i'm a tsvp in heaven or called oist as well and from september i will move to another university and i will uh, con um, be transferred to inside uh, so closer to my place um enjoyed uh, another another university Anyway, in terms of research, um, basically since my PhD, I've been working overall on representation learning. So trying to find the relevant, most of the time, latent uh, representation of the data and trying to find this new representation that is uh, tailored to the task, tailored to the geometry, and that helps you to incorporate prior knowledge or some constraint that we, we know that we have on the, on the task and on the problem. One of my pet peeves is to work on uh, some e um, application on EEG data where uh, we can have some structure that uh, is underlying and that we that we that we like to use. And uh, as Makoto mentioned, I'm part of Miles, so I've done also some work on trustworthy machine learning, mainly causality. Um, yeah, mainly causality. So first, because I guess not everyone uh, is in computer science, so I'll talk about machine learning. So how, what, I, what well, I'm gonna to try to give you some introduction on machine learning and then um, underline the limitation of the usual setup, the Euclidean, the usual uh, Euclidean geometry, and then introduce some tools for that. And then I, I, I will uh, introduce some of my work uh, where we, we learned on particular spaces. So just, Quick word, uh, some clarification, because there is some confusion about the terms. Uh, mainly nowadays, people are talking about AI everywhere. And sometimes people are talking about AI when they want to talk about machine learning, or sometimes they even talk about AI for deep learning. So actually, machine learning is a subfield of AI, and deep learning is a subfield of machine learning. So, but I mean, um, that's uh, well, just the point I wanted to make, because I'm hearing that everywhere, and sometimes it's it gets got my, uh, under my skin. Anyway, uh, it's a it's a, um, uh, a, a domain that uh, has a crossroad of many many other domains. So it, it has we're using a lot of applied math and statistics, and of course some uh, computer science, uh, and it has application in many many fields. And it can go from very theoretical consideration about uh, the convergence of the method and what can, we can learn from that to practical uh, one and implementation with uh, recommending systems that are now on many, many, many platforms. 
Anyway, let's try to give a first definition. So with machine learning algorithm, we're trying to build a model from sample data, what we call the training data. And we want to make prediction um, without being without having to program the behavior. So we want to learn from the example, we want to learn from the data, the, the model that we want to be able to use later on some data that has not been seen. So as a consequence, data is central to this approach. And they have to be available in good quantity and also in, well, in great quantity. The, the, the more we have, the better we, we're. Um, and also in good quality. And the, the, this last point is the very crucial because we have a saying, it's garbage in, garbage out. So if you feed model with crappy data, then you have gone, you're have you going to have crappy uh, prediction. Um, and when I say in good quantity, we want to have enough so that our model are able to fit without learning by heart the data and able to generalize. I'm going to go again on that later. Uh, yeah, and what, what I didn't mention is that all that has a cost. I mean, many people has, have data in their team, but having good data is not always um, the case. And sometimes it takes money to label the data, to have someone that go over it and gives you uh, good data quality that you could use later. So yeah, having data is not enough. You have to have uh, those two things, in my opinion, to be able to apply machine learning um, in, a, in, a, in a way that could be beneficial. Um, in terms of deep learning, so deep learning, as I said, it's just a subpart of, um, of machine learning. Well, just it's a, it's a major subpart of machine learning, but it's a particular machine learning model where you have layers and you're building some representation. Um, it broke many, many scientific laws in, blocks in the past 15 years, um, but it's, yeah, you can just see it as one particular uh, families of models. Uh, sometimes people point the, 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 the limitation of those models that it's a black box, so it's a very complex model where you don't really understand exactly what's happening. Uh, but there's some solutions that are being developed. One crucial thing is that it's data hungry, so you need to have lots and lots of data to make it work properly because it's models that are very, very complex. So if you think about it, if you want to do a polynomial regression, you have to have at least uh, n minus one, well, n plus one uh, number of points. And here you have something that is even worse than the polynomial. So you have to have huge amount of data to learn it properly. And of course, since you have lots of data, it's computationally demanding so that everyone can work on that. And also it's not something that you want to apply to your everyday data. You have to think about which model has to fit to which application. So, but anyway, that's a tool that, I mean, I'm not, uh, I don't belong to any any church or anything in machine learning. I use the tool that has to be applied. So that's a tool that we can use. I'm not against that. I'm just saying that it's a different part. Um, in terms of examples, uh, what are we, what I'm saying, what, what am I, what can we do? Uh, the basic example, the, the basically the hello world of machine learning can be the MNIST data set. Basically you have nine classes. So you have small images of um, 110 numbers. So zero to nine. So class zero, class one, et cetera, et cetera, until nine. And the goal is to learn a model. So to learn something that takes the, the, the images and can output the, the number that should be uh, under it. And yeah, so many, many machine learning models have been learned for, for this kind of task. Uh, and you can go to some stuff that are a little bit more involved where you have uh, paintings, a picture of a painting and you want to predict the style of the painting. But for that, again, you can use many models. Here we used, uh, we used um, some uh, uh, recurrent neural network that we uh, retrained for that, but that was a past project that I like to to show because we did some uh, some demonstrator as well for that. Anyway, so the currently the hype is more on LLM and and ChatGPT and so on, but you have also diffusion model and everything. Um, there's on top of the concern that I've talked about about interpretability. There's also some privacy concerns. So for example. Uh, with ChatGPT and so on, if they're retrained on the prompts that you give, well, later you're not sure that some prompts, some information in the prompts could not uh, be uh, given uh, 
for later prompts. So there's no there, there's a concern on pro about privacy here. Um, again, fairness also the interest in the in the answers for the LLM and the is a classic. And also there's a major, major concern with the intellectual property of the data that we use for generating those um, the, for for learning those those models. And the main the last point, the re reproducibility, since it needs a big infrastructure, not every team can work on that. So if you if a, if a team has many computational resources, then they, they can do things that we're not always able to reproduce in, a, in a, an academic lab. So that's an issue for the field, I guess. So uh, in terms of machine learning itself, uh, we usually distinguish three kinds of uh, learning uh, setups. There's the supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement, reinforcement learning that's a little bit different from that. So uh, supervised learning, we have pairs of, um, we observe pairs, so description of the data itself and the label, so the description of the data X and the and the, and the label uh, Y, and we make the hypothesis that there is a um, functional relationship between the input, the X, and the output, the Y. We don't know this model, we don't know this F, but we want to find one, we want to estimate a, a, a function F hat that uh, approximate well, that makes the correct guess for the data that we have for the past data, but we don't want it to learn by heart the, the data, the training data. We want it to be able to uh, generalize and make prediction for future data that is has not seen. Uh, if your y is uh, continuous, that's a regression. That's a problem. That's a regression problem. If your y is discrete, then that's a classification problem. But basically, the and then that will reflect in the loss that you will use uh, to learn the model. Most of the time, f is a uh, is um, constrained to a, a particular functional family that is usually usually parameterized, and so finding the correct f just boils down to finding the correct parameters. Um, so uh, supervised learning is nice because you have ground truth, so you can like if you just keep aside part of your data that is labeled, you can assess the quality of your model. In the out of sample for the when when how does it work for data that is not been seen? Unsupervised learning, well, there's many types. Uh, one type is clustering, so trying to group together data that looks alike. Uh, the issue with that, I mean, that's interesting, and that there's lots of work on that. I worked on that as well. That's that's nice. That's wonderful. The issue is that there is no ground truth for that it, unless you take an expert of the field and you show him the data, him or her the data, and you ask him or her, if the, if the groups make sense, you don't have any ground truth for that. So that's sometimes a, a setup that is a little bit difficult to validate, but you have many interesting uh, work on that as well. And the last one, reinforcement learning, you have uh, agents that take action, uh, the action can have rewards, and then you try to learn the, some policy, some, some strategy to, uh, to improve, um, on the on some uh, on some uh, model on some environment sorry um, i'm going to be working mainly on supervised learning myself but yeah just know that there's all those other setups and many more so when we have a, a, a supervised learning problem so what do we have we have data so here the data um, are like uh, some observation, some object that we observe. So we have like a, those green, blue, and and uh, um, orange uh, dots that have some value on it. That's our data, and want to feed that to a model. The mod, and then we want the model to be able to, when it's given another ball, to be able to predict the value itself. Um, so. The learning models we want to find an F hat that makes the the, the connection from the space of Y to the, to the space of S to the to the space of Y, and not only able to do it to do it for the for the past data but for any data, and we want for the training data so the X Y, to when when we apply the model on it to to be close to the to the Y Y, so. Um, can be many things. So for binary classification, let's have, let's say we have images of dogs and cats. Uh, we feed that to the model, and we want it to be able to predict dogs or cats. So usually, what we do is that we encode this as, for example, uh, y bit being the set of zero, uh, zero and ones, 
So for example, we will encode that that dog is zero and cat is one and want to, to penalize when the model is making a mistake, so predicting a dog for a cat and vice versa. We have many performance uh, criterion for, for validating a method. But can be, as I said, can be also regression. So for example, a little bit more involved, uh, let's say we have a molecule and want to predict some kind of some boiling boiling point, for example. So here it's like for the previous one, you can imagine many things. I like let's say we had the image, it's only pixels, we try to vectorize it and try to pass it to a model and learn uh, um, a model on the pixels to try to do the prediction. Well, so usually we, we do something more involved than that, but then as soon as we have a molecule like it, we immediately start thinking, okay, how can, can we represent a molecule like this? Uh, um, am I going to take all the atoms uh, and in a, in a vector or thing? So that's usually, yeah, there's many ways to do that, but uh, everything is kind of inside, hidden inside the, this F function that we're trying to learn. But yeah, can be a prediction for, uh, for uh, um, some properties. <laughs> that are in a continuous space or something that is discrete like a label. And we can go um, uh, further than that. We can go to ranking problems where we don't really care about the actual value that we that we give, but we want like, for example, the positive example are ranked higher than the negative one, stuff like this, or multi-class where just have more than one class, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, just a quick, uh, just a quick example on regression. So let's imagine that we have those data. So we have X on the bottom and Y uh, at the vertical axis. We want to do regression. So what will be the impact for the F? So the F function, let's say uh, the first one, basically I restricted F to be a linear function. So, and then finding the parameter of this linear function is just trying to find the combination of the of the variables that will make me my prediction here. Oh no, the first one is constant, sorry. The second one is linear. So we go from a from a family of parameters. So the first one, the, the we have one parameter. Here we have uh, two parameters. So I have the, the slope and the bias. Then we go to a quadratic. So I have more parameters here, have three parameters. And then we go to something that is even more complex. So we had a polynomial will have many more parameters. And we see that from depending on the complexity of the of the function that I ca I take, I can either the first one I clearly I uh, underfit, so I um, I make a a huge error because my model is not complex enough to something where I'm close enough, so something that where I found the, the right model and I and I fit, and I can also like predict to points where I don't have data and it seems to be to make sense to something that is completely uh, stupid, let's say like that. So I'm overfitting. So you see I'm passing through the points. So I make perfect zero error on the training data, but once I want to go out of sample or somewhere that I've not seen any data, then I'm starting to predict something that is a little bit crazy. So we have to, to think about the family model that we're checking. And then <clears throat> once we set the family, then we can optimize. But that's the that's the issue that we have here, uh, in machine learning is fi uh, first finding the right model and then fitting the model. But usually, what we do, uh, we do everything at once. So we fit the model, but we also try to regularize. So we usually have our last function that's the right part. So we want to minimize the some kind of error or some the how far we are from the from the prediction, the, how far the prediction from the correct uh, observation. And then we uh, regularize, so we kind of compensate for the complexity of our method. Um, and usually we, we apply some loss function, some, some penalty terms on the, on the parameter theta that we're using. But anyway, so this is the this is the kind of general shape of the of the problem that we're trying to solve. And what you can see here is that basically, uh, I would say, well, no, I'm not going to say a made-up statistics, but most of machine learning method boils down to an optimization problem like this. So I'm trying to find theta. So theta would be the the parameter of my model. Once I have a theta, I'm able to do prediction uh, such that I minimize something of this shape. 
And then, so like for example, if I take the square norm and I don't take any reg uh, regularization, then I will retrieve a linear regression, for example, if I take the, just a linear model. But you can retrieve many models like this. And even some deep learning models are fit in this kind of uh, setup. So when we have, when we have um, machine learning, usually we solve that through some, uh, when we model that as an optimization problem and that we are trying to solve. Um, but sometimes uh, theta also has to respect some constraints. So for example, sometimes we have some prior knowledge or sometimes we have knowledge that comes from physics that we want to enforce on theta. So sometimes theta is not free uh, in its space. It, it's constrained to some particular uh, sub, sub spot, but more on that later. Um, and also sometimes that's also another point. The data itself is not in any, it is not, uh, for example, in the, in, the, in the RP space. Sometimes it belongs to a subspace, to some curve space. And if we have some information on that, then maybe you could use it to try to improve our, our model as well. And then if we have that, then the model has to be adapted to that. Uh, okay. This is usually the kind of uh, pipeline that we have. So first we have to do some uh, pre-processing or many modification of the data to make it right. And this pre-processing, and there's also many steps that can fit into that. That's one part of what we call the representation learning. So trying to find the right representation of the, of the data. And that, and you can see, if I make some, uh, some crazy choice in here, then of course it will affect my learning algorithm and my output. So since it's the first step, when I do the representation, I have to make it right. Otherwise it's gonna impact the whole, the, re the remaining of the pipeline and it's gonna jeopardize, jeopardize everything. So we have to think about how uh, to do a correct representation. And we also have to think about the, what the end task when we're doing the representation. Um, so as I said, representation matters because any processing or any encoding that we do will affect the, the data quality and the, the remaining of the pipeline. And we can also go further, like I could apply a modification on my data, like some phi, some phi function I could apply to the data and that could potentially change the difficulty of the task. For example, if I find a proper phi, I could make the final task easier. Let's just take an example. So you see like the, okay, I have the blue point. It's a, it just a made up example, it's easy, but I have the, the blue point that is one class and the red dots that are another class. And I want to find a, a, a separation of them. And let's say I only have linear models in my, in my tools that I can use. Of course, on the left side, I cannot do this um, linear separation at all. But now let's say that Instead of learning a nonlinear model, I do a nonlinear modification of my data. So this nonlinear modification is just the one that I show here. I just take x1, x2, but I, as a third uh, dimension, I can use the product of x1, x2. And now I move from uh, uh, polynomial representation, but now I could have, you know, if you plot the same data here, but now we are in 3D, we can see that now we have a hyperplot that could separate the data. So now if I do the proper encoding, they, I can have a, a very simple classifier, a simple, very simple method that could separate the data. So finding the right phi make the, the, the task easier after that. So that's why, and, and actually that's what um, many uh, deep learning models are doing. They're, try, they're learning a very good phi that then makes the separation very easy. as I said. <laughs> um, and also sometimes, well, that's uh, something that is a little bit old fashioned, but uh, I did my PhD when deep learning was not hype again. And I what did what was called at the time kernel methods. And in kernel methods, uh, some you can see, you can interpret what you're doing as learning some kind of implicit representation of the data. So in a way, sometimes learning this classifier is a way, in some way you're learning an implicit representation. It also fits into this, uh, this setup. Um, so representing the data, like learning this kind of phi is as if you were uh, not directly accessing the data, but seeing the data, like let's say you have data that are 
uh, objects that are 3D shapes, and you can only see them through their uh, shades. So if you don't choose the correct shade, like here, the, um, so we have uh, integration mark and, and exclamation mark, and they're in 3D, and if I just cast the shade, so let's say we take P2, so we, we, we cast the shade on the side, and we see that the, the shade are basically the same. So if I choose P2 to represent my data, everything mixes and I cannot recognize anything. Now, if we take the P1, then P1, the, shade, the shapes are completely different and then it, it becomes easy to, to separate them. So that's a bit this, the idea behind finding this five, finding the correct representation so that it's easy to discriminate, it's easy to distinguish. So that's, that's also pleading for the fact to adapt the representation to the task and not just take uh, some, some representation that would be completely decorrelated. Um, <clears throat> so usually what happens, so we have our observed samples that belong to RP. So we have vector data, we have the parameters of the, of the classifier of F and the parameter of our five function a ga let's call it gamma, that also belong to some uh, vector space. And then everything is wonderful and we remember our lectures in optimization 101 and then we can just uh, find the stationary point of, an, of our loss function and then we're happy with that. Problem is not all data uh, are uh, like this. We can have data that can be structured. So for example, if we have molecules that are encoded as graph, then we, can do, we cannot do it. We cannot do that anymore. And we have to know in a, that the data have some kind of invariance or geometry that we have to use. And sometimes the set of admissible values for gamma and, for gamma and theta, uh, it's not the whole space. We have some, some constraints that we also have to enforce. So this is where the fun begins, I mean, to me. Uh, and that's what we're gonna talk just after. So <clears throat> just checking the time. Um, gonna, just gonna cover some limitation of the Euclidean space. So Euclidean space usually, well, that's flat space. Um, and basically we, uh, in this, uh, in this space is basically it's based on the axiom laid by Euclid. And the one that we usually cite is that two points are uh, connected by a straight line and the sum of the angle is 180 degrees can be extended to more than three dimension. And usually what you have is a scalar, well, you use a scalar product, from that you can derive a norm and you can compute distances and you're happy with that. Um, however, it doesn't work for all, uh, all data. For example, for graphs. So graphs can model molecules, cold points, social networks, many things for that. We can see that we will see that Euclidean uh, geometry doesn't work. So this is a graph, uh, an example of a graph. So we have we have uh, uh, four vertices that are connected by th uh, one, two, three, four by four edges. So we can represent that through what's called the adjacency matrix. Adjacency matrix. It's a matrix. It's a square matrix where you have ones where the points are connected and zero elsewhere. So we have a first one, but actually we could use another adjacency matrix that would represent the, 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 the graph in the same way. Problem is it's, it's permutation invariant. That means that depending on the matrix that I choose, I mean, I represent the same data, but it's not encoded in the same way in the, in the computer. And if I just try to use the Euclidean geometry on those two representation, I mean, that represents the same thing. So the distance should be zero, but actually if I just, take the, the linearize those vectors, those matrices as vectors, and just take the element-wise difference, then I'm gonna have many places where they don't agree. So many places when it's not, it's not gonna be zero. And then I'm gonna have something where the, the distance between them is not zero. And, the, and we, can we cannot have that. So if we use the Euclidean distance over the adjacency matrix for graph, is bound to fail because depending on the permutation that we use, depending on the order that we have for the graph, it's not going to be, um, it's not be, it's going to be a proper distance, and then it's not going to be something that we could use for machine learning algorithm. Of course, we can just build on that and try to find a permutation invariant distance. So instead of just taking the Euclidean distance between the the two adjacency matrix, 
we could encode that as uh, actually finding the permutation that minimizes the Euclidean distance. And then if we do that, we would have a proper distance. But then that means that for finding the distance between two points, we have to solve an optimization problem that is NP-hard, which just a graph isomorphism. So we just put an extra problem on that. So that's, uh, well, we have to find another way to find that. But just to say that this non-Euclidean geometry would work, but it's just computationally uh, a burden. Uh, another example that I will use a bit more just after is the space of SPD matrices. So the matrices with uh, strictly positive eigenvalues. Uh, that's something we can find uh, covariance matrices in some uh, multi-sensor signals uh, in uh, EEG uh, and so in many more uh, applications as well. So for e for the for the EEG applications, so usually so EEG it's uh, sensors of the scalp. We are recording the electromagnetic activities. Um, and then you have to find a representation for that and do your classification algorithm. Um, usually what, well, one of the tasks, for example, we won't use all the sensors. Sometimes we will just focus on the sensors over the motor imagery if we have some particular task. But anyway, instead of just having the raw signal, what works well for some application is just to take the covariance of those uh, sensors over uh, uh, a particular windows of time. But if we do that, so uh, SPD matrices, oh, I'm sorry, the images are a bit blurry. Uh, you can think about them as um, hyper ellipsoid in some kind of space. Um, and so they have a shape. They are not only big, they have shapes. And actually, if we use the Euclidean geometry between those uh, ellipsoids, so let's say I have the matrix A, the matrix B, and then a plus B over two, so it's a classical average. But if I do that, actually the sh you can see that the shapes, so you have uh, a tiny matrix on the left, a very skinny matrix on the right. And then on the middle one, you have something that is inflated. What I, what I mean by infl inflated is that the determinant of it is way bigger than A and B. A and B I have the same determinant. If we think about it, determinant, so it's the, volume of the of the ellipsoid that's kind of the amount of information that has been stored in the covariance matrix when we are averaging we don't want to add information right that would be weird so actually we have some um, some artifact of the averaging and that's one thing that happens here when you were applying euclidean geometry that might be an issue when we do uh, machine learning after so Using Euclidean geometry for this kind of data is usually not so good. And, and we will see that there's other geometry that you can use for that. Which led me to, to introduce a bit of a Riemannian geometry. So uh, first question, what's a manifold? Well, actually we're living on a manifold. We're living, the earth can be seen as a manifold. The, uh, the, the, so what we mean by that, it's a, it's a curved subspace of Rn can be locally approximated by plans, and two points are not joined by a straight line, but by a curve. That's the minimizing, uh, that minimizing the distance on it. Um, well, uh, if we want to go in a bit of a more detail, uh, we have some kind of Russian uh, doll structure for the mathematics that we want to use, but the bottom, the bottom line that for Romanian geometry, we want to have a linear in each point of the of the of this space, we want to be able to linearize the space, and we also want to have in this linearization a notion of a proximity. So we want to have a scalar product. That's the only thing that we want. We want something that's curved and locally we can approximate it linearly, and we have some notion of uh, of uh, distance there. I'm a bit short on time, so I'm going to skip a bit. Uh, just the thing is that uh, if we want to compute distances, then we're gonna locally integrate on the on those uh, on those uh, hyperplanes to have the this the the so we are integrating over the so if we have a curve on the manifold, we are going to integrate the uh, the speed at each point of the on on the trajectory. Um, in some cases, nice cases, we have close form for that, and we're happy with that. And but yeah, I'm not gonna talk about that more in depth. 
This can come in many flavors. And the one that I mainly use are matrix manifolds and mainly stiffer manifolds. So that's uh, orthogonal, skinny orthogonal matrices and SPD matrices. So the one that I talked just before. Um, but there's many more. So there's many constraints that we could have on matrices that we could encode. Like as soon as the, as the constraint is smooth, we can encode that most of the time as a, as a manifold. Um, just one last thing about this SPD, uh, SPD matrices. So if we have a two by two covariance matrix, matrix, actually two by two, so I have three free parameters. It's symmetric, so I only have three parameters. So it means that the two by two matrix, I can just plot it in 3D, right? Uh, A, B, C, that's just my space. And now the constraint that I want is that it's, uh, the, the eigenvalues are strictly positive. That means that I can draw this constraint, that's the, the grid, and I have to lie, my point has to lie strictly inside this grid. As soon as I am on the grid, I have a, a matrix that is, uh, that is um, uh, low rank. That would not be positive definite then. <clears throat> so now if, if we look at the, at the image, the, the, blue, the blue straight lines is the Euclidean geometry that we will use on those matrices. Okay, that could work. I mean, that's a subspace. That's a, that's a subspace of the symmetric matrices. So we could use that. Uh, we could do interpolation. We, so we would create matrices that would still SPD. But, as, but if we extrapolate, we could leave the cone and create some matrices that would not be SPD. So we could like violate some constraint and have some covariance that have some kind of maybe complex, um, complex uh, elements. Um, that means, well, this being said, so we have the swelling effect that I just uh, talked about just before, and we can use a, a, a remaining distance. So there's many that we can find, but we can have, there is one that is particularly nice because uh, it gives us, so the distances are computed along the, the, the red geodesics. We can do interpolation, we can do extra extrapolation because we're only tangenting the cone. And this is nice because we don't have with this one any swelling effect. That means that if we extrapolate or even if we inter interpolate, the determinant will be constant. So we're preserving the shape. We're not just only uh, in interpolating, we're pre preserving the shape, which is nice for, for our case. Okay, so if we want to solve a problem now of the form that, again, as previously, we want to minimize some, some function over a space. And now if the, <coughs> if the space is RD, we're just gonna do gradient descent or your favorite uh, continuous algorithm. And you're gonna um, make iterates that go closer to the, to the solution. If you're convex, you're gonna have a unique minimum and you're happy with that. Uh, now, if you are not on the RD, but if you are on a manifold, then you have to be a little bit more creative. And this means, so this uh, is, uh, just one slide for optimization on a particular kind of manifold. I'm going to go into detail. If you want to see more, just uh, look at the book, uh, Optimization on Smooth Manifold by Nicolas Bouman. It's really great. But what we usually do, we compute the Euclidean gradient of our cost. This might not be on the tangent space, so we have to project it. And now that we are on the projection, we have some fast algorithm that makes, that uh, enables us to go from the tangent space back to the manifold. And if we do that, so we have the, the gradient, then we project on the tangent space that gives us an element of the tangent space that parameterizing a geodesic that minimizing the cost. And then we can create an iterate on that. And now if we have that, we have a remaining gradient descent. We have a, an algorithm that help us uh, minimize the loss. And the nice thing is that at every iterate, we have a, a feasible solution. We'll have something that is on the manifold. So we have something that respects the constraint at every point. There's many libraries for doing that. Yeah, usually what you, when you want to do that, uh, you only have to implement the cost and to implement the gradient. And now, even if you don't, if you suck at algebra and you don't know how to compute your gradient, there's Autograd that will do the work for you. So it's really, I mean, that's uh, very easy to use. Uh, if you have problem like that, please consider trying. That's really nice to play with. <coughs> As I said, if you do that, you have admissible solution. Sometimes, well, most of the case, you have faster convergence than using the Euclidean counterpart. 
you can encode some invariance. You can try to use some prior knowledge to incorporate in your learning problem. Okay, sometimes it may not converge. Like for example, if your optimal solution is out of the manifold, that means that you will not be able to reach it and then you will diverge, can be numerically in intensive. And sometimes since there is this notion of optimal solution being out of the manifold, sometimes you can have some numerical instabilities. But let's just stop on a particular problem that I like and that we'll use just after. It's called the Frechet or Karcher mean averaging. So basically you're looking for a point X that is um, close to all the points that you observe. So you compute the square norm, the Riemannian square norm, the Euclidean square distance, sorry, from CI, your observation, to some point X. And you want this X that is close on average to all your points in, in, your, in your manifold. So if you use the Euclidean distance, that boils down to the classical estimator that you know for the average. Uh, mm -hmm. In most of the case, on the space that, uh, interesting space, curve space, there is no closed form solution, but actually you can just solve it with a, uh, as an optimization problem, and you can just find some very classify, simple classifier out of that. And that's what we're gonna discuss just after, but just keep in mind that's one, one interesting tool to, to have in your toolbox. And if we want to do learning on manifold, okay, I'm gonna skip that. I'm just gonna talk about one, one application of that. So, as I said, uh, the, the SPD matrices, we find that in EEG data, and it's the current state of the art. Actually, that's the, the, the thing that uh, works well for brain-computer interface. Um, so we know how to compute the Riemannian average of SPD matrices. It's a relatively easy problem. Um, the, and then from that, if we compute the average on each class, then we have a very simple classifier because we can uh, see for new points well, which class they are the closer and then just predict the class like this. The thing is that as soon as the dimension increases or as soon as the rank is close to be rank deficient, we have some problem with the geometry, it becomes instable. And it's something that can happen a lot when we have EEG data. So we could model that as a missing data problem. And we would be in the second case. So that means that we have sometimes some sensors that got disconnected. So that means that we have a whole series of uh, signal that's missing. And if we compute the covariance of that, that's like if we have a uh, rows and columns that are full of zero. If we have rows and columns that are full of zero, then the, the matrix is uh, rank deficient. It's not SPD anymore. And we cannot apply the geometry and the very set. But actually, uh, the set there's still information in this matrix. So like out of those uh, dark lines, there's still some relevant information that we maybe would like to use. And we can just extract it with the mask. So if we just do the, the this uh, M transpose sigma M, so actually we know the part that are missing. So we could just ignore them and just extract the set matrix. And if we do that, then the matrix is SPD. So now we can just try to modify a little bit our, gem, our remaining averaging problem and try to leverage the data that we have anyway. So that's like this. If I, ha if I apply the mask left and right, then I'm going to extract the sum matrix, and the sum matrix is full rank. So we go from this intrinsic mean problem, this remaining mean problem that we have here, that we, don't, we know how to compute the gradient, to the following one, where actually we just compute the, so each each observation, we just compress, we extract the information that we have on it, and then we're gonna, uh, it's gonna uh, in, um, contribute to the average only to the part that we observe. And if we do this, then the gradient uh, can be deduced from that, and it worked well, and it were, we were happy because it was a geodesically convex problem in some cases. So we, it meant that we have, it meant that we have a unique solution for most of the cases. And so it worked quite well. Uh, that was nice because it performed better than the Euclidean counterpart. So that means that forgetting about the fact that we have this structure, if we have the Euclidean counterpart, which can just ignore that, ignore the part where they don't have the data. But if we do that, then the Euclidean, the Riemannian uh, averaging that we used was better. 
And uh, there was a Romanian naive heuristic that would be just ignoring the, the data where uh, we had missing information. But then we're in the scarce regime, so we don't have lots of uh, signals. So if we ignore signals where there's still some information, that's a bit, that's a bit uh, bad. So yeah, but the stuff that we proposed was working better and, and had some nice promising results on EEG data. And actually currently we're working on some extensions uh, for missing subspaces. But I'm running short on time, so I'm gonna skip some thing and just go to the conclusion. <clears throat> so um, what I wanted to say is that the data representation is a, a crucial step, it must be well adapted to the task you understood it, should be adapted to geomet the geometry if you have some knowledge on that. Uh, there's many things that I left aside in this presentation. So all these structures about convexity that have been uh, generalized to geodesic convexity, so we can uh, do many things. Uh, uh, we, we can um, define some optimization problem that we for sure know will converge to a unique minimum. There's many notions about curvature and question structure that are also left aside. And something that I did a talk is that basically uh, deep learning has also been adapted to this uh, this setup. So there is graph net graph uh, graph neural networks, a neural network that are applied on graphs that have many also nice properties about the expressive power and the invariance that they can encode. And there's a, even some work that has been applied for this uh, SPD matrices as well that are deep networks. Uh, right now, I'm working on some. Uh, visualization for SPD matrices, also like considering uh, trajectories on the space of SPD matrices and how to average them. And with uh, uh, Thibault, a student of mine, we're working also on, on probability, probability distribution of those curve spaces. And it brings some interesting, uh, interesting problems. Anyway, what am I doing here at OIST? Well, there's a wise person that once once said man, not so long ago that chemistry is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. So now if you go in front of a chemistry lab, you will completely understand the smell that can be a bit odd. <laughs> uh, anyway, the meaning is that it's easy to have ideas in this field, but it's the, the, the challenge, the actual challenge is to check on them. But actually, could we could maybe do some screening. That means that uh, from the past experience, from the data that they have, maybe there's some stuff that could be just uh, left aside and some ID where put the priority should be given to some, 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 some experience compared to some other from the past experience. And basically it's like doing a little bit like a in silico test. So we are, we are working on some, uh, some, um, some uh, nascent project uh, at the interplay of uh, computer science so with Makoto, Christine, and Louise, um, at the interplay of uh, chemistry and, uh, and machine learning. And uh, we have pairs of monomers, so don one donor, one acceptor, and we're trying to predict the charge mobility. Um, there's many challenge involved here. So the, the, as I said, the data representation is one, one thing. Uh, we're also in the scarce data regime. We don't have many data, but we want to leverage them anyway. So it's a, it's a, it's a new project that's very exciting and that we're, we're kickstarting here. So yeah, I'm done. Uh, sorry. Mm, yeah, I went a bit uh, out of time, but uh, thanks for your attention. If you have questions, now is the time. Much for the uh, nice talk. So, uh, if you have a any questions, uh, please uh, use the microphone to uh, ask the questions because I think the Zoom pass can't hear. Yeah. 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 Um, so, thank you. That's really, really very educational. <clears throat> so, when you when you take AG data and you turn it into a, a correlation matrix, then you do you lose some time resolution? Yes, okay. So I went very fast on that, but <clears throat> it works well for what's called a particular setup called uh, moto imagery or moto imagination. So basically you ask the, the subject to imagine that is moving a limb um, and not moving, but in the in the well, you know more than me about that, but in the, in the motor context, basically it behaves a little bit like the same. And if you just measure the EEG, you will, so let's say I'm imagining I'm moving the right arm, not moving. 
So in the in the left uh, motor cortex, you will see a rise in the power of this of the sources of the of the neuron area here. But it's very noisy signals. So usually what we do, we don't. So we're not really interested by the, the raw signal. We're more, more interested by the power of the sources that we have here. And actually, if we compute the covariance matrix on the diagonal, you have the variance of each sources, which is more or less homogeneous to the power. So we have the same information here that people used to use. But on top of that, we have also the covariance of the sources. So it's a richer source of data. And it proved to be uh, worth it because compared to the previous uh, state of the art where people only use the power of the sources, uh, we're, <clears throat> we're much better. So we have richer sources and more, in more interesting data. But I agree, we lose the temporal information, but that's not where the information is actually. And we can, uh, I can talk about that later if you want. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, so maybe you need to think about it. Okay, <laughs> okay I have one question. Maybe oh, some questions in Zoom. Okay. So uh, there's a question. I have one question. Can you give me more intuition about how you convert non-positive definite covariance due to gap to positive definite covariance? Uh, you okay. can just read if you want. Okay, so uh, okay, when when the number of sensors grows for each data, sometimes we can be um, non not positive definite. So we can have some source, some uh, some eigenvalues that are zero or very close to be zero. So the so if that happens, maybe that's not the right moment to use uh, Riemannian geometry on that, or you can maybe sometimes compress the data and try to find some subspace, so we're trying to remove those uh, sources that are z that, that have zero power. Um, there's also some heuristic where people just reach, so they just add some some um, some value over on the diagonal for all the matrices, and then they know that they're going to be strictly positive. So that's the basically, yeah, two approaches that you can do if you have that. Hope that answers the questions. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? So I was curious about the project that you sketched at the end. Uh, do you know how you're going to go about this? I mean, scarce data presumably means the number of molecules or the number of measurements of transport. Or... So there's some in-house data that we're yeah. structuring. Um, the first, so uh, we're we'll starting to discuss. So there's uh, one promising representation of molecules that we started discussing called Coulomb matrices, where um, instead of just having the graph of each atoms connecting to which, uh, you would have some information about their number of uh, atoms, etc., and and the the the, the, the proximities. Uh, but actually, for charge mobility, we discussed you know, it's maybe not so smart, and we wanted to have more information. So now we're looking at what's called localization, the localization matrices that have some information about the, the electrons themselves. And in a perspective of uh, charge mobility, that may makes more that will make more sense. 